We're uh, here at the Institute for Policy Studies on April 12, 2013. We're interviewing uh, Sanford Gottlieb. Uh, Mr. Gottlieb is a was a professional uh, lecturer at American University School of International Service. Uh, he worked in the peace movement from 1960 to 1993, the first 17 years as political action director and executive director of the National Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy, better known as SANE. Uh, he, uh, before uh, going to uh, SANE, he was a labor organizer for several years, uh, and he's the author of, a, of the books uh, uh, Defense Addiction and Red to Blue, Congress and Chris Van Holland and Grassroots uh, Politics. Uh, he, uh, we'll, he'll fill us in on his other background now, and uh, welcome uh, to the uh, interview. If, if you could just uh, give us uh, briefly uh, uh, where you grew up, uh, what maybe your early influences were that took, took you into uh, working for uh, peace uh, and to war, uh, and uh, what you did before you came to Sane in 1960, which will be the focus of our, of our interview. Fine. I, uh, I was born in Brooklyn in 1926. Uh, <clears throat> my um, father, as it turned out, uh, was a con man and uh, spent a good part of my childhood and adolescence in federal prisons for uh, mail fraud. Uh, my mother uh, supported the family uh, as, a, uh, as a sales lady. I grew up during the Depression and um, uh, in the 30s uh, was uh, most aware of a growing uh, conflict in, in Europe and, and uh, Asia. Uh, from an early age, I remember uh, the, the Italians attacking what was then Abyssinia, now Ethiopia. Uh, the, the rise of Hitler and the, the sp spread of Japanese militarism uh, while, I was a, while I was a kid uh, looking at it from, from New York. And um, I had a, a very early awareness then of, of the, uh, the dangerous world I was growing into from that window in, in New York City. Um, I went to uh, public schools and um, a, s a semester each at uh, City College of New York and Brooklyn College, and then joined the uh, Navy at the age of 17 in a, uh, in a Naval Officers Training Program, uh, which took me to Dartmouth College, from which I graduated in 1946, while still in the Navy, but then had a medical, a medical discharge that um, uh, took place in, in 1946. In 47, I got married, and um, uh, one week later, my wife and I took off for Paris, where we stayed for five years. Uh, I went to uh, the School of Political Science and then did a doctorate at the Sorbonne on a, on a, a labor topic. Came back to uh, New York and uh, in 52, at the height of uh, the Joe McCarthy period, it was quite a, uh, quite a culture shock after five years in, in uh, Paris. Had a <clears throat> took a long time to um, find a job. Had uh, many, many months of unemployment except for uh, being a correspondent for a French news weekly, which uh, was unable to pay me in dollars. Uh, eventually, I broke into the labor movement, which is what I wanted to do at the time. And I worked uh, first as an organizer for two different local unions in, in New York. Um, I was hired by the International Typographical Union on a national daily labor paper called Labor's Daily, published then first in Charleston, West Virginia, and then in uh, Dav <clears throat> outside of Davenport, Iowa. I came to uh, the Washington area while working for Labor's Daily, which folded in, uh, in the late uh, 50s. I went to work for the uh, International Union of Electrical Workers and finally as uh, assistant to the president of, uh, of AFSCME, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. <clears throat> 
in um, <clears throat> 1957, uh, the National Committee for Sane Nuclear Policy, which was called Sane for short, uh, <clears throat> was formed in New York. And I was one of um, uh, several thousand people who responded to the first ad that Sane put in the New York Times, and an ad that, um, excuse me, <clears throat> the first Sane ad um, was uh, devoted to um, <clears throat> ending nuclear tests, which were going on at a, a rapid rate between the United States and the Soviet Union uh, in, in the uh, late 50s. And I was um, uh, just somebody who sent in a donation and said, I support what you're doing. The people who organized SANE had no intention of creating a membership group. They thought naively that uh, by publishing a series of, of uh, uh, intelligent ads uh, on a crucial issue, they, they were going to change government policy. But the response to the first ad was so great that they had a membership group on their hands whether they wanted it or not. Ultimately, I became a, uh, uh, a member of the Washington group that organized here and um, ultimately a uh, chairman of the group. And by, um, by 1960, I was lobbying myself into a full-time job. I started in February of 1960 as the political action director of SANE. And um, the, the MO of what I was doing really had less to do with lobbying the members of Congress or the administration than it did to trying to organize grassroots support for a treaty to end all nuclear tests. And that, that remained uh, my, uh, my approach uh, throughout all of my activity at SANE. I eventually became executive director um, in uh, 1967. But the focus, my focus, was on the grassroots uh, rather than directly on the decision makers themselves uh, <clears throat> out of a conviction that uh, the decision makers were only going to be influenced if they had a constituency, either locally or nationally, uh, that was active and informed and unwilling to put pressure on them. Uh, we were up against a mindset in the public that I suppose one could call the, the Cold War mindset, and that is that um, the Soviet Union, which was one half of the, the uh, group that was uh, testing these bombs, the Soviet Union was out to take over the, take over the world. And uh, the public was extremely dubious that you could make agreements with um, such, a, such a power. Uh, so we had, um, I think, that, that mindset as our, our major obstacle. It was, it was carried by the people in power, um, and it was prevalent, prevalent in the uh, uh, in the um, public at large. When I first started, there were only a handful of organizations that would, um, <clears throat> that worked in this, in this area. SANE itself was, was formed by people on the one hand who were pacifists, people who had made a moral commitment against the use of violence on the one hand, and on the other hand, world federalists, people who had um, uh, in mind the creation of a world government. Uh, needless to say, both, <coughs> both um, of those um, roots of the, the peace movement at the time uh, were 
tiny minorities in a in a Cold War country in the in the 1950s, where the <clears throat> The effects of uh, Joe McCarthy and the uh, broader congressional witch hunts were still still very present. Um, working for peace in those days, uh, in the in the eyes of some Americans, was just analogous to being traitors. Uh, f for the broad public, I think. The, the kinder parts of the broad public considered us just simply naive. Um, the only um, groups around in 1960 when I started were from the pacifist wing, the, <clears throat> the Friends Committee on National Legislation, which did very effective work as the lobbying wing of, of the Quakers. And I was housed in, in their building in Washington. Some of the Protestant churches had uh, peace divisions, the Methodists in particular, the United Church of Christ, and the Unitarians. Um, <clears throat> and then there were the World Federalists. And that was about it. And then Sane came along and brought in, brought in uh, I would say, a new, a new part of the public that was uh, more secular, uh, mostly non-pacifist, um, and, and the movement did uh, expand at, at that point. Uh, we worked initially on the, on the test ban treaty, and um, that, during, the, during that period, a few other organizations were created, in, in particular Women's Strike for Peace, uh, which uh, some, of, some of whom had started with SANE and then expanded into an old woman's uh, kind of direct, direct action uh, kind of uh, organization. Uh, but we remained uh, very much a minority, a minority in the country that um, was able eventually to support the new president who came in in 1961, John Kennedy. John Kennedy was a, um, a cautious Democrat, uh, but an open one. And he was in part influenced by uh, a remarkable man who was at one point in this period the co-chair of SANE and of the United World Federalists. And that man was Norman Cousins. Norman Cousins was the, uh, <clears throat> the editor and publisher of Saturday Review of Literature, and he had remarkable access to members of Congress and to presidents. And he uh, became an influential voice uh, in, the, in the Kennedy administration. And Kennedy became, uh, over time and, and gradually, uh, a, a champion of the Test Ban Treaty which was eventually uh, signed in 1963, although it was not a complete, uh, it did not uh, uh, reach all of the goals of the, um, uh, of the movement. That is to say, it banned nuclear tests uh, in the atmosphere uh, and underwater, but not underground. And that permitted nuclear tests to, to continue without the dangers, or most of the dangers, of above ground testing. And it was above ground testing that created the emotion which permitted the peace movement at the time to, to expand. Uh, that is to say, people became aware that radioactive fallout was a danger to people's health. And uh, that became the uh, the motif on which Sane and the other groups, um, in Sane's case, uh, uh, expressed the opposition through continuing series of ads in the New York Times and elsewhere. Yeah, the Dr. Spock uh, ad. And then the, then the, doc the Dr. Spock ad was, was the, the real biggie of the time. Dr. Spock, of course, was the, 
nationally known and internationally known uh, baby doctor um, who, uh, who was recruited into SANE by my predecessor as uh, executive director, uh, Dr. Homer Jack, a Unitarian minister. And um, this, this full page ad in the New York Times came out showing Dr. Spock in his, uh, in his medical coat and, and a little, uh, little girl, he's standing there soberly uh, looking down at her and the, the, the text uh, said, uh, Dr. Spock is worried and it contained uh, his, his statement about the, the dangers of, of fallout. And it's, <coughs> it's a fa their effect particularly on children. Uh, that that uh, ad uh, had a tremendous uh, uh, repercussion outreach and he became uh, uh, a kind of a folk hero in the, in the, in the movement uh, at the time and um, that helped mobilize many, many thousands of, of people. Um, <clears throat> by the time the test ban treaty was, was uh, reached, um, the Kennedy administration had formed its own coalition, uh, kind of including us uh, as, as um, one, uh, one wing they didn't want to put forward too, too much into the, into the uh, foreground, but including the United Auto Workers and the National Farmers Union and, and, and some, some other churches. So, so the, at, at the very end, at the, at the legislative end of this, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the initiative was being taken by the Kennedy administration uh, in addition to what came from the grassroots. And it's, uh, as you're talking, I'm thinking about the, uh, a president who actually uh, would entertain uh, uh, the thinking of uh, outside thinkers and intellectuals, I mean, and Norman Cousins, uh, over the years, it seemed like we lost that sort of uh, presidents who were influenced by, uh, by things outside the political realm. Well, it was particularly remarkable in, in, in those days um, because of the Cold War mentality. Um, the, uh, the government was, uh, I'd say basically trusted up until the Vietnam period, basically trusted by the public as knowing what to do on national security. Um, so you didn't have many presidents going looking for uh, outside uh, counsel um, from, uh, from beyond, the, beyond the governments. Um, Kennedy was open, and, and uh, to his great credit, uh, uh, he, uh, he was able to uh, absorb um, uh, this, the very good advice from Norman Cousins. Um, it was most expressed, most clearly expressed in the American University speech by, by Kennedy, which um, Cousins had a great, great deal to do with. And it was the, that speech in 1963, just before the test ban was reached, was really a call for an end to the Cold War. The first call for an end to the Cold War by, by an American president. Um, also, I think we should say that it was not the peace movement itself that came up with the formula for dealing with the public's problem of how do you, how do you reach agreements with the Soviet Union, which was seen as this dictatorship that was threatening the whole world. It was Kennedy, and maybe, maybe it was the words of Cousins, I don't know, but it was Kennedy who said, you have to work on common interests, and he named them. 
we, we have a common interest with the Soviet Union in avoiding war, in preventing the spread of nuclear weapons, and reducing the costs of these, this mutual arms race. Uh, so that was that was extremely important, and uh, I have to say we didn't we didn't formulate it. Kennedy did. Then we uh, come up to the period, of course, uh, Kennedy assassination, and Lyndon Johnson comes in. Were you were you, uh, were you a little more wary of him, or how did you view him as far as the uh, arms control uh, issue was concerned? Well, I <clears throat> remember um, going door to door for Lyndon Johnson in 64, um, and uh, what, was, what was coming over the horizon at that point was not so much the uh, nuclear arms race, but Vietnam. And uh, I remember Lyndon Johnson saying in the 64 campaign, you know, uh, that that was a fight for Asian boys, not, not for American boys. Well, that didn't last long. And by, uh, by uh, summer of 64, uh, the, the Tonkin Bay uh, incident, uh, Johnson got out of Congress this resolution, which became the basis for uh, letting, letting the executive branch do anything it, it wanted uh, in Vietnam and step-by-step -step, uh, escalation. Uh, Sane was um, one of the very first national organizations to uh, look for a negotiated settlement of the, of the Vietnam conflict uh, <clears throat> into which uh, more and more American military advisors were being placed at that point. And ultimately, of course, uh, half a million uh, American soldiers. Um, in 1964, uh, we, um, we circulated a petition among American college professors uh, calling for the neutralization of North and South Vietnam. And that was released publicly at a press conference in Washington with Professor Hans Morgenthau as the main spokesman. Uh, and um, by then it was, it, was, it was clear going into 65 that the uh, uh, Johnson administration was becoming the, the main, the main um, uh, engine of, of uh, the war. Um, one of the uh, people around who, who knew something about Vietnam, unlike uh, the vast majority of both the American public and the American government, was Bernard Fall, the French-born uh, scholar and author. And um, he and I consulted a great deal in those period, in that period. And I remember being awakened um, one morning in February of 65 by a phone call from him uh, saying they did it. They did it um, being a description shorthand of what we were hoping wouldn't happen, not, not, uh, specifically the, the bombing of, of North Vietnam and the real start of the uh, American uh, military uh, uh, direct, direct combat role. Uh, at that point, um, Dr. Spock and Professor H. Stuart Hughes of Harvard University were co-chairs of SANE. And I uh, drafted a, a um, telegram for both of them to send to Lyndon Johnson, um, a telegram of protest. Dr. Spock had campaigned openly for Lyndon Johnson in 1964. And um, he was a little, a little bit reluctant to uh, take my language. Um, thought it was a little stiff. 
uh, but he went along with it, as did Stuart Hughes, and we sent it off. And that, that marked the, the, the break with Lyndon Johnson. I think that was particularly noticed because of, of Spock. Um, that was publicized. That that was publicized, yes. and, and I, we know we know for sure that, that Johnson uh, noticed it more more for Spock than for you know Sane in general, um, and then we uh, we became uh, what ultimately developed as as the as a leading uh, organization in the moderate wing of. of of an anti-war movement that burgeoned from there on in. Um, in, in 65. In 65, uh, yeah, yeah. There was um, a sane sponsored rally in yeah, New York. Yeah, right, right. SDS had a demonstration. Uh, SDS, SDS was the first one to come in, the Students for a Democratic Society. They were the first ones to come in with the National um, March on Washington in, in April. Then Sane sponsored a, uh, a November March on Washington, which was the first non-student non March on Washington for peace in Vietnam. And by then, by then, yeah. there, there were um, more radical groups and, and lots, of, lots of ad hocery uh, in, the, in the peace movement. A lot of discussion uh, about um, about the goals and, and the signs that we should be carried, um, most of which went on in, in, in New York. I was bless, blessedly uh, largely removed from, from having to spend whole, whole, whole days and nights uh, doing that. Uh, but the, the November March turned out to be a, a coalition of the more radical groups and, and sane and, and one or two other or moderate groups, um, and as the movement, um, well, let me let me just say that the um, there were two things that were noteworthy about uh, about the march. There were about thirty-five thousand people who who came, and that that figure was determined by people sitting up on the stage with me at at uh, the Sylvan Theater at the Washington Monument. Who, who had a great deal of knowledge about uh, sizes of crowds. One was Norman Thomas, the, the grand old man of, of uh, the movement, and Coretta Scott King, and um, Ed, Edwin Dahlberg, who was the uh, head of the, uh, uh, the American Baptist Convention, the Northern, Northern Baptists, although I don't think they took a, um, a denominational stand. He, he was one of he was one of the spokesmen. Um, there were two two things that were particularly um, important. One was that um, the, the the goal, the established goal of, for the march was uh, a negotiated peace in Vietnam, and that was that was accepted grudgingly by the more radical wing because the more radical wing wanted an immediate pullout of American troops. Um, and this marked, this marked a substantive division between the, the, the two wings, although by, in 65 the two, the two went along on this one demonstration. The other thing was that I had to deal with Viet Cong flags in the demonstration. There was a, a group uh, that was essentially a um, pro-Chinese communist group that paraded around with Viet Cong flags. And I wanted to keep them out. And um, there was no good way to do it. And ultimately, I, uh, I failed. So they, they showed up, with, you know, maybe nine or ten people and their Viet Cong flags and a crowd of 35,000. Um, the, the news coverage of the event, 
was not so much devoted to what people said from the rostrum, although there was a little of that. Norman Thomas saying, uh, don't, uh, don't um, trample on the flag, uh, cleanse it. Um, and the New York Times and the Washington Post admired the, uh, the middle class quality of the people. I think the Times, the, the participants, the Times I think said um, they resembled uh, shoppers at Macy's. Uh, now, why, why, why was this uh, noticed by the, uh, the mainstream press? Well, because by, by 65, it was already becoming evident, largely through the treatment of television, that the public's view of the anti-war movement was of scruffy radicals and in this particular case, radicals carrying Viet Cong flags because part of the news coverage, on the one hand, Macy's shoppers, on the other hand, the, the Viet Cong flags got as, as much attention in the, uh, in the media as, as uh, the rest of the, the uh, <coughs> participants. And this became a very important consequence of the radicalization, increasing radicalization of the movement as it went along because even as we got bigger and bigger crowds um, to the demonstrations, the fact that there was a radical wing, an increasingly larger radical wing, where which um, um, first of all, rejected uh, electoral action in favor of street action, and which was either insensitive to or trying to flaunt um, middle American values, uh, that, had, that had consequences. That had consequences because Television was guaranteed, absolutely guaranteed, to bring into American households pictures of the most flamboyant forms of protest. So it was Viet Cong flags or ultimately was burning of American flags. I can remember much earlier in a demonstration we had in front of the White House with maybe a dozen people uh, on, on the nuclear testing issue, local television showed up and um, the, the one guy who was wearing sandals was, was the one that, that they showed on television that night. Well, when they had, when they had uh, flag burnings, um, that's, that, that was guaranteed to come into the living rooms on television. Now, what, what, did, what did this mean? It meant that <clears throat> by 1968, public opinion polls were showing a majority against the Vietnam War and a bigger majority against the war protesters. Um, people who were against the war in 68 included not just the peace movement, which was still a minority, but people who thought it wasn't worth the lives and it wasn't worth the treasure. Um, and we can call them middle America. And middle America had values. And one of the values was patriotism. And against patriotism, again, again in a, against a Cold War mentality where the Cold War had gotten hot. Um, so the, the results of this strange dynamic, a, a dynamic which was also fueled by something else going on at the time, a youth revolt against authority. And these were la largely more affluent teenagers and early kids in their early 20s who um, 
were in revolt against uh, their parents, against uh, the government, against religion, um, and uh, certainly against the military. And they were mixed in in the anti-war movement and made it a much more volatile, complicated uh, business. So the political effects of this, that by 68 you had you had um, a, um, a silent ma majority emerging. These were the people who were against the war, but more against the war protesters and who didn't know how they could express their opposition to the war because expressing their opposition was getting into bed with these people. And that silent majority was manipulated later, not much later, by Richard Nixon who basically didn't have to be concerned with the protests because of this, this dynamic. Just jumping back for a second to 1965, uh, I think it was after that demonstration, you and, uh, I forget, uh, uh, who it was had a meeting with uh, Hubert Humphrey. And oh, yes. How did that come about? Yes. And that came about on? because of Norman Cousins, actually. Uh -huh. Hubert Humphrey, and I should say that by, in 1960, I was a volunteer in Hubert Humphrey's office. I uh, did some ghostwriting for him, some of which was published in his name, not mine. Um, he was the Senate Disarmament Subcommittee Chair, um, the only one in Washington who talked about disarmament, which was, of course, uh, the goal of SANE. Uh, so something of a, of a hero on, on that and on civil rights and on, le <coughs> on, on uh, domestic legislation. So I, I admired Humphrey. I had worked for him. But he also became vice president under Lyndon Johnson. And he became the unfortunate lapdog of Lyndon Johnson. And he spent a lot of time out al across the country denouncing the student protesters. Well, the day after that, <clears throat> November 65, March, um, Cousins arranged for us to meet with Humphrey. Cousins, Spock, Homer Jack, and myself. And Humphrey started off by lauding us as having strengthened the people in the administration who, who were the doves. Presumably he, met, he meant himself. And having said that, he immediately uh, went into an attack on the student protesters. He said, they remind me of the commies I used to know in Minneapolis in the 50s. And I got really pissed off. <clears throat> and I spoke to him in a way that I wasn't used to speaking to people in. Uh, especially vice presidents. Especially <laughs> vice presidents. And I said, <laughs> you're not in the 50s anymore. <clears throat> you're, not, you're, not in, you're not in Minneapolis anymore. You said that? I said that. And uh, it's not the 50s anymore. And these students aren't commies, but if you keep pushing them, they may go that way. And he kind of sat back in his chair. And in the next week, I was uh, surprised to see in the Washington Post a little, a little item that said, uh, Humphrey had met with the uh, Vietnam Day Committee, which was group of the radicals in, on the University of uh, California, Berkeley campus. But soon thereafter, it was back, back to the same, same old stuff. Hubert being um, the, the attack dog, really, for, for uh, 
Lyndon Johnson. Um, so, and, and by uh, 1967, Singh was in fact calling for Johnson to. 67, we were involved in the Dump Johnson movement, um, working with Allard Lowenstein, who t for, for a short while was on the same board. And, and we, we were the first um, national organization to, in, uh, to uh, endorse Gene McCarthy, who um, entered the Democratic primary and, and got a, a, big, a big vote, not a, not a majority vote, but a big vote in, in New Hampshire. And then in, that encouraged Bobby Kennedy to come in so that the, the two, the two uh, uh, Democratic uh, uh, politicians in the Democratic prim primary uh, helped ease Lyndon Johnson's decision not to run again. Was that contentious with insane at all as far as the Dump Johnson movement? No, was no, yeah. absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. No. What was contentious, not with, with insane, but within the movement, was electoral action. Uh, the radicals didn't believe in it. Mm -hmm. And as late as 19, uh, going into 1972, probably in 1971, I was um, at one of, the, one of the national conclaves of, of uh, one of the radical groups and introduced a resolution on behalf of SANE calling for the movement to spend that year, this was, this was after 68, now going into McGovern time in 72, uh, working to elect a, a peace congress. And it was defeated hugely, hugely. So um, the contention was that between uh, the radicals and the moderates, the, the radicals did not believe in, in trying to elect the people who were making the decisions. Um, so Sane, Sane became the first um, national organization to endorse McCarthy. And um, then of course, soon thereafter was the, uh, was the assassination of Kennedy, the assassination of King, uh, the, uh, the complete demoralization of, of the movement uh, the uh, the um, peace plank that was being pursued, uh, spurred on by by uh, movement moderates at the Democratic convention in in 1968 in Chicago, um, but there was not just the peace plank going on on the in, on the inside. On the outside was this huge anti-war demonstration by all kinds of groups and a police riot against them. Well, uh, we were kind of astounded the next day, next days, to find out that the public sided with the police. And uh, Hubert Humphrey did too. Yeah. Pardon? And Hubert Humphrey did too. Yeah. He, he, he sided with the police. He, he sided with the police. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but where did the, the public perception come from? Uh, um, I mean, the, the investigation into it did, concluded that it was a police riot, but in the days following, the, the public was so incensed against the, against the um, anti-war people that they, they lumped together moderates, radicals. They were just, again, uh, those, those people in the streets. They didn't care what was going on on the inside of the convention. And uh, that's, that was another, another sign of this, um, this dynamic where what they were seeing on, on television was, was interpreted as the anti-war movement and uh, they didn't—they didn't want to have anything to do with them. So um, 
go into the 68 election and Hubert Humphrey didn't quite summon himself up as independent of Lyndon Johnson and, uh, and Nixon became, became president. There, there were uh, big, uh, big anti-war demonstrations. Same was involved in after that period. Yeah, of, yeah. The, and was that tense coalition? Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah. It was tense coalition, and I'd say by '67, by '67, you had the real split, mm -hmm. and and here's here is where um, Dr. Spock took off. <clears throat> 67, uh, I had a meeting with Dr. Spock um, in which he said uh, everybody he knew in 64 when he, or 63 when he first came in cautioned him to, be, to take, it, take it easy, be cautious. Uh, he had a... a global reputation to preserve, uh, don't fritter it away. And he said, the, the, he said, the more I um, have been in this, um, the more uh, I don't want to be cautious. And what was, what was the issue? The issue was, um, with, with whom do you demonstrate? And um, increasingly, as the frustration mounted over the war, and the movement became more and more radical, uh, within, within SANE we saw this division on our, on our own board. One group said, we demonstrate with er anybody who's against the war. The other end was a group that said, um, we won't demonstrate with radicals. And then there was a group in the middle that said, depends. <laughs> Dep depends what they do and what they say. Um, and Spock, Spock was with a group that said, um, we, we will demonstrate with anybody. And he, uh, he left the board of saying and went off uh, with the radicals. Ultimately, uh, I believe he also ran for president. No, that's right. 1972, I think. Yeah. It was a 72? Yeah. Yeah. Julius Hobson, who uh, we're gonna, uh, would like to have interviewed, was his running mate in 72. Uh -huh, right, that's did, right, Julius well, Hobson. I mean, when you mentioned Spock, did, um, and we're here at IPS, Spock, William Sloan Coffin, Marcus Raskin and others were subsequently indicted by yes. the federal right. government for allegedly counseling people to avoid the on the draft. draft. Right? Was, was Coffin still? Was he still involved with Sane at that point? No, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. no. Co Coffin was not involved with Sane until the merger with Sane Freeze. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. And but I, I, Sane wasn't involved in uh, uh, draft. No, no, say. no. And uh, I was just wondering though, if that indictment sent any sort of chill through the, through the organization. Oh, it certainly sent a chill you know, throughout the whole movement. Yeah. yeah. Um, that, but that was, um, that was only one of maybe the, the most egregious, but you know, uh, responses from government. Um, should say that we discovered ultimately from from uh, the Freedom of Information Act uh, that in the early 60s the FBI was at, at Sane's meetings with informers. Uh, we know that um, Army intelligence uh, was on our mailing list. Uh, we know that uh, the CIA opened at least one, one piece of domestic mail, which was <clears throat> illegal. Um, so so these, uh, these responses were not altogether unexpected. Um, by, uh, by 73, uh, we discovered we were on the 
Nixon's enemies list, uh, which didn't have any direct consequences except to uh, uh, give us more, uh, more kudos, more credit in the, in the movement, uh, <coughs> except for those people on the enemies list who were audited yes. very carefully by the, the IRS, which was not the case with, with Sane. I wonder, if think that, I wonder if this got into your FBI uh, files that you met with representatives of the NLF? Yes, in, in 65, well, let me, <clears throat> let me back up just a little bit and say that when I was in Paris for, for five years, this was 47 to 52, the first Indochina War, French Indochina War, was, was going on. And I lived in a student house with students from all over the world, actually in a, a closed down brothel that became a student house. And among the students were close friends from Vietnam. Um, <clears throat> and we maintained the, the friendship uh, years later. Um, but we, we got a sense of uh, Vietnam from the students who lived there of one very important thing, and that was uh, <clears throat> Vietnamese nationalism, a nationalism that was based on 2,000 years of history and opposing the invasions from China, ultimately opposing uh, the Japanese invasion, and uh, ultimately uh, of course, in the, the French. Um, so I knew, I knew a little bit about Vietnam and was, uh, <coughs> was uh, learned a little bit more from, from uh, Bernard Fall and uh, from, from reading and reading the, the French historians. Um, in 1965, the American Friends Service Committee, which had, <clears throat> which had a, a staff in Viet South Vietnam, organized a trip for uh, members of the clergy, a fa fact-finding trip. And they invited me to go along as, a, as a, an advisor. And so we had uh, little time in, in South Vietnam in, <clears throat> in the summer of 65, and I, I wrote about the, the trip in Saturday Review, again, with Norman Cousins, uh, who helped finance my, my trip. Um, and then uh, in 65, I also went to Algiers and Paris to meet respectively with the diplomats of the National Liberation Front, the Viet Cong uh, political arm, and North Vietnam in Paris. And um, I would um, go to the White House before I went off to find out what, what the line was, what, what they were saying. And I would talk to them when I came back but I also went public with it. And so I, I went to the press. And one of the things I, I discovered in, in posing questions was a, uh, something of a gap between the South and the North Vietnamese communists. I posed the question, how long do you think reunification would take? And the North Vietnamese diplomat said, five years, and the South Vietnamese communist diplomat said, 20 years. Um, that's one of the things I reported. I, I went back in 66, uh, and um, when, I, when I went back to Algiers, I was told, uh, we, we authorize you to announce that you can use uh, th this uh, office um, for the delivery of mail to American prisoners of the Viet Cong and the 
they didn't say Viet Cong, National Liberation Front uh, in South Vietnam, which I duly reported back, back in the States. That, that uh, was a, a strange, strange episode because they reneged on it and later uh, reopened it. But in any case, there was, the, there was this uh, period of, uh, of fact-finding, really, which is what I was doing, uh, with, um, with both the North and South Vietnamese communists both in Algiers and Paris and later in, in Prague and, and, uh, and Moscow. Um, uh, I, I subsequently learned that uh, in 68 there were, there were American governmental efforts to, uh, um, to, to, to uh, establish contact with the, the, the same people but never came to anything. Uh, the uh, the administration did um, botch a meeting in Warsaw in 1966 with North Vietnam, uh, which could have could have um, changed the course of of the war. But basically, um, Lyndon Johnson was too intent to on keeping the pressure on militarily to make serious efforts to, uh, to negotiate an effort, to uh, negotiate a, uh, uh, a treaty. The, um, of course, subsequently the war was escalated to, to go into Cambodia. And right. Spain had some right. response to, to that. Well, that, <clears throat> that was one of the huge um, uprisings of, of, from the public when, when uh, Nixon expanded the war into Cambodia and a, a, a flood of, uh, of students. That's when, that's when the students really came in. Um, uh, and um, they helped create uh, an expanded movement. Um, the moratorium uh, was, was a direct out, out um, outgrowth of that, where they were um, a, a more moderate um, student group took leadership, uh, Sam Brown and, 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 and others. Um, and, uh, you want to just briefly explain the moratorium? The, the moratorium was, as I recall it, a, um, an effort to, to organize communities to, uh, around the country to stop work, stop classes, uh, and devote, devote a, I believe, believe it was a weekend um, in, in 1969 to uh, anti-war discussions, um, debates, um, dis, de demonstrations, uh, lectures, um, and, and it brought in uh, brought in a good a good amount of support from uh, more moderate uh, adults as well as well as students. Saint had not, uh, at some point they uh, called for a cutoff to, for funding for the war. They hadn't, they hadn't done that. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, uh, eventually, Saint under the Nixon administration came out for um, a, a gradual uh, withdrawal. Sane, uh, you're right, you're right. Uh, Sane. 74? Was it, was it 70, 73, 74? Yeah, yeah. The War, War Powers Act trying to, um, trying to put some boundaries on, on what the president could do by himself. But uh, subsequent, um, subsequent uh, presidents uh, Ignored it. Yes, yes. The, um, so, yeah, so during that period, some, you, you left in 77, during that period from roughly 74 to 
77 did the same turn its attention elsewhere with the Vietnam War? Uh, um, one, of the, one of the constants during this period was um, opposing uh, increased military spending and specifically on <coughs> weapon systems that would um, that would expand the arms race. So during that period, for example, we were opposing the uh, B-1 bomber. Uh, we were also uh, <coughs> opposing the um, uh, the anti-ballistic missile system, which still doesn't exist. Uh, but but the anti-missile system, essentially because of uh, the reaction that we thought it would provoke from the Soviet Union. One of the things you mentioned beforehand, that since we are at IPS, you, and we were talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and you said that you happened to have a call uh, a day or two in advance of the, the official finding, uh, the official announcement. Yeah, I, was, I was visiting the University of Michigan and <clears throat> got a call from a friend in the White House uh, whose name was Marcus Raskin, <laughs> <laughs> went on to other fields afterwards yes. to tell me that there were Soviet uh, missiles in Cuba and that this would become public soon. Um, and I, <laughs> I guess I gulped and thanked him for the information. So he was a dangerous leaker. He was a dangerous leaker, yes, yes. He was a dangerous leaker. Um, I, I told, told what I had learned to uh, the professors I was visiting. Who were, they helped come up with a, a sensible approach, which, as I recall, had a great deal to do with going to the UN. But it was just, it was just a... Uh, a period of, of utter powerlessness when uh, just the few, the few people in, in a, a room in, in Washington and I guess in, in Moscow were, were making all the decisions. And Since uh, the, our project is called Lessons of the 60s, uh, <clears throat> do you want any lessons for today? I mean, of people who are concerned or actively demonstrating against war, continuing war in Afghanistan or drones or secret assassination lists. Uh, what, what sort of lessons uh, from that era can be applied today and what are some that shouldn't be applied today? <clears throat> well, I, I think the, the most important uh, lesson <clears throat> is, is valid at all times. And that is if if public opinion is, is going to be an influence, and it has to be, <clears throat> because all wisdom does not re reside in the Congress and the White House, and these are the decision makers. Um, if public opinion is going to be a, a determinant, then activists have to understand the values of the public, be sensitive to the values of the public, and be able to appeal to the most positive values that the public shares. And in, as in the case of uh, Vietnam, um, clearly patriotism is, is one. Uh, I'd say probably um, more broadly today, it's national security. It's not just the tendency to, to wave the flag, but to, to be concerned that there are threats uh, and uh, threats to the United States and um, be able to come up with a, an approach that uh, recognizes that there are threats without exaggerating the threats and without thinking that the only responses, for example, to the threat of ter terrorism mm 
is military force. So this whole c concern that we had, we really discovered in the Vietnam period of values and beliefs out in the public has to be at the center of your, your formulation of goals and tactics. I don't know that I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that wraps it up rather really nicely. Well, uh, we, we could just, without going to, you left saying, uh, and you went on from there. Uh, oh, yes. <clears throat> I left Sane in 77 and became executive director of a, um, of a student professor organization called United Campuses to Prevent Nuclear War. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, ge I'm getting my chronology mixed up. No, I, when, I, when I left in 77, I went to a, an organization that had just formed that just lasted about four years called New Directions. It was supposed to uh, be uh, a multi-issue organization on, on uh, uh, more peace issues and um, foreign policy issues more broadly and um, economic development. Uh, that, uh, that lasted about four years and then went under. Um, interestingly, it went under uh, because in the late 70s, it, it didn't have a an emotional issue that was going to capture the public the way fallout did and then the Vietnam War. And while you need facts and you need sensitivity, you also need an emotional issue uh, that people are going to respond to if you're going to have numbers. Um, there was one emotional issue in the late 70s. It was a sleeper but it was an emotional issue for the right wing. It was the Panama Canal treaties. Yes. 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 <laughs> and, and this is one of the issues that New Directions fought on, but it didn't realize it was going to be overwhelmed by reaction from the, yes. from the right wing, that, which didn't want the United States to give up the Panama Canal. Anyway, uh, in, um, from, from New Directions, I went to be executive director of um, a group in the, in the Reagan period called United Campuses to uh, <coughs> End Nuclear War, UCAM as, as it was called. And UCAM was an outgrowth of this, the, the tremendous upsurge that came when Reagan started making noises uh, that convinced people that, hey, this guy, was serious uh, about starting a nuclear war. Uh, the public, the public as a as a whole, started getting worried in the in the early 80s that uh, nuclear war was was becoming a real a real possibility. Um, possibility. So the uh, the the students students and faculty started with uh, uh, teach-ins teach-ins across the country, originally sponsored by the Union of Concerned Scientists on college campuses, and then they, this, this spun off and became an independent, an independent group. And then finally in, um, in uh, um, the, late, the late 80s, I went over to the Center for Defense Information started by Maverick uh, Admiral Jean Larocque. And um, we started a, a weekly television show called um, America's Defense Monitor. Uh, with, uh, with, we started with actually with two, two of us. On, that was the staff and, and tapes and, and got it on some cable stations and eventually expanded it. So at one point we were on 100 uh, PBS stations. 
on, on more war peace issues and dealt, dealt with the, uh, the um, whole range of, of, uh, of issues from uh, <coughs> Vietnam to, uh, to uh, uh, the Iraq war and uh, military spending and, uh, and had, uh, had, had quite a little audience. Vietnam question that I, uh, I should have asked, that despite the divisions, despite turning off a lot of the public, being turned off with the war protesters, how instrumental were the demonstrations and the organizing against the war in ending the war? Did it, did it, did it end it sooner? Did it, uh, <clears throat> if you look at the dates of the war, yeah. if you use 1965 as the beginning of the American combat role, and the end of the combat <coughs> role, 1963, that's uh, 73. By my arithmetic, that's eight years. It took the French eight years to be defeated also. Uh, I'd have to say that uh, because of the dynamics we were talking about, television and, and um, radical forms of protest carried into American living rooms. That the movement was essentially neutralized, did not end the, <clears throat> end the war, uh, probably ended, uh, probably prevented some of the worst plans of the Johnson administration. They didn't bomb the dikes in North Vietnam, for example. Maybe it did that. It uh, helped teach a whole lot of people how to dissent. But because of, because of the nature of the movement and the media, um, I can't say that the, the war was, was shortened by a day. Uh, Nixon was able to spin out the negotiations which, which finally took place uh, while gradually reducing the numbers of American troops until there were none. Um, and. Uh, the silent majority that was built up in this time permitted him a free hand, basically. So a very, a very sad outcome. Very different from the testing period, the nuclear testing period, when you know, we had at least a, a major uh, goal partially achieved. peace movement, um, do you have any um, particular times or things or events that you, you feel the most happy with and that you feel the most proud that you were a part of? Or is there a special period that you particularly treasure having done all this activist work in Washington all these years? Well, I would, <clears throat> I would think the, the nuclear testing period definitely was, was a high point. Um, we were a, a tiny minority. We were uh, um, a small little coalition, um, but we did we did uh, have a, a president who um, who agreed with the goals. And he, uh, <coughs> he didn't come quickly to the goals, and he didn't come fulsomely to the goals, but he, he did come to them and he acted on them in tandem with the movement. And, and this, is, this is a prerequisite for success. The movement, uh, no, no movement by itself um, is going to succeed 
uh, in getting its goals, depending, depending on what the goals are. Now, some, we should say that some, some depends on the decision makers. Um, we, we are talking about war and peace issues. We know who the decision makers are. They, they are in the, the White House and in the executive branch and in the Congress. If you're talking about the feminist movement, for example, that's a far different, far different um, set of decision makers. Um, they're, they're, everybody is a decision maker. So um, they're perhaps a, a, um, a movement can succeed without somebody in the White House. But when you're talking war peace issues, um, you can't. You can't without f either affecting the, deci the, the decision makers or replacing the decision makers. But you've, you've got you've to focus on the decision makers. So it was, it was a happy time that we had a, a growing movement, a movement that was not riven by internal splits and we had a president and ultimately uh, a Congress that would, would go along. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.